In the late January of 2013, a flight of seven Saab Gripen CD landed at Nellis Air Force Base in the United States in the middle of the desert. One may wonder what a bunch of Swedes in small fighter jets were doing in the middle of the desert. Well, very simple, they were going to the red flag. The red flag is probably the best training exercise for a military pilot in the world. By the use of a sophisticated electronic simulation equipment, the air missions over a vast expanse of American desert are as close as it gets to a real war. The Swedish Air Force and the Gripen had already been at the red flag a few times, the first time in 2006, with very good results. But this time was different. This time, the Gripens were on the red team. At Red Flag, the simulated hostilities are between two parties, the blue and the red team. Uh, the blue team is normally intended to simulate a NATO force operating against an opponent, which is a mix of other NATO forces and the professional aggressors, uh, the red team. While the blue team operates with all the high value assets that the NATO is planning to deploy, like OWACs, electronic warfare, support planes, ground control coordination, and so on, the red team has much more limited support. The AWACS or the ground control just send you in the direction of the blue force and good luck. Many were curious to see how the Gripen would have performed in such a difficult role. It is not impossible to imagine that many had thought that the small fighter was going to be an easy prey, but oh boy. They were very, very, very wrong. The Grippers networked their system with some planes acting as OAXs. OAXs? Is that a word? They gained the necessary situation awareness and used their electronic ship to avoid the air defenses and get within the range of the enemy planes. The first day, they scored 10 kills, including Typhoons and F-16 Block 50+. During the whole red flag, they never lost an aerial encounter, they never failed the mission, they never delayed the mission for bad weather or technical problems. At the end of the exercise, the only fighter with a score better than the Gripen was the mighty F-22. And even that, only just. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end because the stuff that we discuss here are very difficult to find anywhere else on YouTube. It is always difficult to have accurate reports on training exercises. What you have to work with often are fragments of information and not always very reliable. While our initial story may not be 100% accurate, it actually reflects the tone of all the information I was capable of unhurting, including some quite old paper. After some research, it was clear that there were no news of the Gripen doing bad in an exercise. The plane was used in Libya as a reconnaissance asset, but it never saw combat, so all we have are these exercises. There are the Typhoon pilots who say that if the Gripen is using its ECM for real, it can get scarily close before being detected. And then there is that time when three Swedish Gripens went against five Norwegian F-16s, and the result after three rounds was 5-0-5-0-5-1 for the Gripens. Or that episode when in an exercise in Sweden a Gripen acting as an aggressor surprised three F-15 shooting down two and scaring away the, the third. Or the reports from the Royal Thai Air Force that during an exercise against Chinese J-11 and Sukhoi-27 achieved a 4-0 kill ratio. So there should be a reason for all this good press. Every single seat Gripen is armed with a 27mm Mauser BK-27 cannon, but this is only the tip of the iceberg. Saab is clear that the Gripen is sold with the ability to integrate every weapon the customer may desire 
and the plane is designed to make the process the easiest possible. The hard points have been designed since the beginning to be compatible with NATO standard, but more importantly, the software is designed to be modular. The flight control software runs in an isolated kernel, while any other piece of software is actually a separate application that can be installed and run autonomously. So while the physical integration still needs to be certified and to work on the plane, the software controlling the weapon is just a separate executable installed on the modular computers and it doesn't require to retest and recertify the rest of the software when installed. And Saab is using this architecture to continuously deliver improvements to Gripen's customers. So for the air-to-air -air role, the plane is certified for Sidewinder, Amram, Skyflash, Iris T, Darter, and notably the Meteor, which gives the plane a remarkably large kill zone. If you are interested, there is an entire video dedicated to this very peculiar weapon. For the air-to-ground missions, we have tactical missiles like the RB-75, which is actually a copy of the Maverick. We have long-range cruise missiles like the Taurus. We have Paveway, laser-guided bombs, G GBU-39, small diameter bombs, uh, JDAMs, RBS-15, anti-ship missiles, and anything else you may think of. The maximum payload for the EF version is around 6 tons. The Gripen has also been integrated with various pods for reconnaissance or target designation, like, for example, the Israeli Lightning, which is quite common, but also many others. While the panoply is remarkably large and open to implementation, there are other areas where the Gripen is shining and shining very, very brightly. The Gripen has been built around its suite of sensor and electronic warfare. This was a choice dictated by the consideration that physical stealth effectiveness is slowly being eroded with time by new defensive countermeasures and tactics. Stealth based on geometry and rather absorbent materials is hard to upgrade in any way because it is built into the aircraft structure. Relying on sensor and electronic warfare, on the contrary, allows for a continuous improvement of software and hardware. And grip and sensor, in fact, have evolved massively from the version A to version E. The main sensor in version E is the Raven ES5 radar produced by the Italian Galileo in Scotland. At the moment of filming, it is considered to be one of the best AESA radar in the world, even if the performances have never been declared, uh, there are two elements that set it apart from the competition. The about 1000 emitter receiver modules use gallium nitride, which is reported to improve the efficiency and the sensitivity of the antenna by a definitely non-negligible amount. As usual, the actual numbers are a close-guarded secret. The second element is the so-called repositioner, which is a true stroke of genius from an engineering point of view. AESA radars usually have a flat fixed antenna positioned within the radome and perpendicular to the plane axis. AESA radars steer their beam electronically, switching on and off the antenna modules at high speed, allowing for much more sophisticated search, track and map techniques than a conventional mechanical antenna. One advantage is that in this way the complex and expensive gimbal mount required to point the antenna in a specific direction is just removed, improving cost and reliability. The Raven ES5 has the antenna mounted at an angle with the axis and the antenna rotates around the axis. The great advantage of this solution is that the radar can look backwards. A modern AESA radar can achieve beam deflection from 60 to 80 degrees on each side. The antenna inclination angle adds to the deflection and the beam can be actually pointed backwards. The Raven ES5 declares a deflection of 110 degrees, but considering the geometry of the radar, I would expect to be more. The advantage of this is that the plane can still track a target while moving away from it or just running circles around it without using additional antennas 
position elsewhere on the airframe like in the Sukhoi 57. If tracking can be maintained, then the weapons can be guided to attack the target by data links or semi-active homing. So to be totally clear, the Gripen can attack a target there. There are very few radars in service or in development that use this configuration and there is a sort of philosophical debate if reintroducing a moving part is worth it. But still I believe it is an outstanding solution. Quite curiously, the brochure that can be downloaded from the Galileo website says that the radar can track one target and this is something that I don't believe for a second uh, since even the most lightweight and simplified modern radar can track multiple targets. The other main sensor is the Skyward G infrared search and track. Once again, built by Galileo in Erviano near Milan in Italy. Some reliable press sources say that it can be considered the most advanced infrared search and track currently available on the market. And well, as usual, it is difficult to confirm these press allegations, but surely it is a modern product that includes all the features that can be found in a modern infrared search and track. It uses dual band sensors and optical zooms and it claims to be able to track up to 200 targets at the same time. If it's true, it is outstanding. Like your home theater amplifier, the infrared search and track has a digital video exit, an analog video exit and a network exit. Unlike your home theater amplifier, it doesn't use commercial standards. The digital video standard is the recent uh, Arink 818. The analog video standard is the Stanag 3350, a well-known RGB-based format that has allowed the exchange of videos among different platforms since the 90s that is way, way behind <laughs> the civilian counterparts in terms of pixel resolution. The network connection is based on the venerable MIL STD1553, which is the Ethernet of military equipment, even if more modern standards do exist, like for example the fiber optic bus used by the Eurofighter Typhoon. It is through the MIL STD1553 network that the track information from the radar and the infrastructure and track flow to the grip and modular computers. The information is analyzed, tracks are deduplicated, and they are presented in a unified picture to the pilot who in turn can use them to generate the fire solutions for the weapon. While this feature was present on the grip and A, it was only the grip and C that could achieve proper data fusion rather than simple uh, co-presentation. In the grip and EF, the feature has obviously been refined and on the Brazilian variant, the characteristic three multifunction displays have been replaced with a single panoramic wide angle screen, similar to what is installed on the F-35 uh, that could make the happiness of every video game player. Data can be shared with other platforms by Link16, but the Gripen has also its own stealth proprietary link. Actually, Sweden was one of the nations that pioneered the integration of data link into planes and ground stations, and the sub in the early 60s had some primitive forms of data link that kept evolving with the Vigen into the modern implementation on the Gripen. The electronic warfare suite is considered to be the grip and strong point and the secret sauce that makes the plane so lethal despite the other limitation. It may seem strange that a country like Sweden could produce uh, an outstanding electronic warfare suite, but Saab and Ericsson have a long tradition and they always kept a low profile. And they have been so good at keeping a low profile that we really know very, very little about the electronic warfare suite. We have the usual diagrams showing the hardware, uh, the location of the sensor, of the antennas, and the countermeasures. We know that a TAU decoy is available. We know that the electronic warfare fuses its data with the other sensors. We don't know for sure if the plane can provide a fully passive fire solution to the missiles, uh, but we can safely infer that this is the case. But what matters the most, we don't know any detail about the jamming capabilities. What we know is that the Typhoon pilots know that the Gripen is impossible to be seen till when it's too late. 
So if you like this video, I'm sure you will be interested in the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. If you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon or Subscribestar, that would be amazing. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very much for watching and goodbye.